I've opened all the previous fall updates with a somewhat bleak image of heavy black plastic silage tarps laid out on field one, which we had hoped would starve out our bindweed problem. But when we pulled off the tarps last week, pale white remnants of the bindweed vines were clearly visible, and light digging revealed a robust, seemingly undamaged root system. Sometimes change occurs quickly on the farm, and having finally secured a reliable source of clean shredded leaves, we began the initial stages of putting this section to bed for the winter. We'll just have to wait for springtime to know whether this treatment finishes off the bindweed, but we're sure that the leaves and cardboard are going to protect and nourish it over the winter. This second section of Field 1 has already had compost laid over the new beds in the new row spacing, and the plan here is to cover the whole area with shredded leaves six inches thick. After raking the leaves into the narrow paths next spring, these should be prime beds for planting. High Tunnel number 1 has been producing head lettuce quite nicely. The left-hand bed was planted through the residue of pole beans, and the lettuce has benefited from having its lower leaves held off the surface of the soil with much less rot and mildew on those leaves. Stems of the okra cover crop have been laid in the pathways and even the modest amount of winter foot traffic should continue to break them up into a beneficial mulch. The center bed has been planted fairly densely with a soft neck garlic a few weeks later than the field garlic. Next spring it will size up much more quickly than the outdoor garlic and be showing good sized heads six weeks or more before the field harvest begins. High tunnel number two has lettuce planted on compost mulch soil and these varieties are more upright which allows good air circulation around their lower leaves. We still have calendula blooming in here along with a few nasturtiums that aren't as happy in the increasingly cold nights. Even if we aren't making money on these flowers, it is excellent for the soil to have living roots in it. Those flowers interactions with the fungus in our soils and maybe even their nurture of a few remaining beneficials makes them a valuable crop. Notice in the adjacent bed the stems of tomatoes intentionally left to feed the soil biology until the winter closes all that down. This patch of alyssum has been growing from last year's volunteer seeds right inside the north doors of High Tunnel 2, and I like to think of them as a welcome mat for all our beneficials. Tunnel number 3 is the only tunnel without a second layer of plastic, and spinach should overwinter easily in here. The gaps in the direct seeded crop have been filled in with plants from the propagation house, and you may see a few yellow leaves on those new transplants. Out in field two, one of the experimental cover crop cocktails is showing the effects of the erratic temperature swings we have endured this fall. This bed was planted on September 17th, almost exactly two months ago. Buckwheat and daikon were broadcast on the bed surface, then our old reliable earthway garden cedar was used to sow oats and field peas. The buckwheat germinated after some heavy September frost and nursed the daikon, peas, and oats through their germination. Later frost finally killed the buckwheat, and a series of cold snaps pretty much finished off the oats and peas. The daikon struggles on, but all those different plant types with greatly varied root types have brought something different to our soil. Here are two of the ways we overwinter production beds. Those with the thick straw mulch are all planted in garlic. The straw evens out the winter temperature fluctuations and keeps abundant moisture in the ground. Straw just seems to light up the surface biology of our beds and it provides excellent cover for earthworms and ground beetle activity. The black occultation strips, made from woven polyester, can be a pain in the rear to keep in place on our windy farm, but because they allow oxygen and water to pass through them freely, they will leave those beds in good shape for planting next spring. If 
If it's a snowy one, their black color will melt snow significantly faster than cover crop ground or even, goddess forbid, bare earth. This single bed of winter rye was planted on October 21st, probably too late for real biomass production, but clearly it is ready to grow any time the air temperature goes over 45 degrees. To the right are two more beds of garlic under straw, and then a few leftover occultation strips from last summer's butternut squash patch, and in the distance kale plants, green and dark crimson, tucked into their winter blanket of straw. We've had a few fall pickings off the kale, but the real value of this late planted crop will become apparent with some frost sweetened tender leaf pickings in the very early spring. This spinach for overwintering has produced well this fall, but as the sun sinks lower and lower in late November, there just won't be enough solar energy to keep up their growth. They'll go dormant and may look pretty scrappy in the spring, but once the strength of the sun reaches them through the melting snow in late March, they will put on impressive, sweet and flavorful leaves that put the taste of our tunnel-grown crops to shame. Next door to them are the two daikon cover crop beds. Even though they've taken some hits from the freezing temperatures this fall, they maintain a nice, thick canopy of leaves over the bed, and their long tap roots are mining our subsoil for essential nutrients. In another season, I might be upset to see this much of the field left without a cover crop, but this year's medicinal hemp patch was given a thick mulch in early July, just as we were planting it, and that mulch continues to protect and nourish our ground. Hemp has a reputation for soil improvement, and by leaving their extensive roots to rot in the soil, we take advantage of their slow decomposition, which encourages fungal activity in these beds. The hemp crop was laid out on our new bed spacing, and if we can get enough shredded leaves this fall, we may attempt a thick application of them down here as well. Finally, at the western edge of the farm, we have one more bed of garlic, and then more winter rye in the last eight beds. Rye has been a popular cover crop in New England due to its reliability and cheap seed cost. We ran into some problems with it during our first years of no-till conversion, primarily due to the thickness of its root mass after spring regrowth. We could terminate the rye with our roller crimper, but even though it left nicely mulched beds, the crew complained that it was impossible to transplant through those tough roots. We bought heavy-duty, sharp soil knives. We tried hooking up a single gang of wavy coulters to cut lines for the row spacing, but nothing really worked except a shovel, and that was just too darn slow. We've come a long way in five years, and we're going to try this year with rye as a cover crop again. Flail mowing, occultation strips, maybe even silage tarps will open things enough to plant through. Another discovery for springtime. Thanks for watching.